Hi everybody. I'm Ling Shu, and today I'm going to talk about the Cantonese culture and the world. When talking about Cantonese, I believe lots of you guys will think about Hong Kong, Canton, or even Shenzhen, which is the city that I lived in. And of course, all kinds of food also. And some of you maybe know this. <laughs> It's a famous clip, but not lots of people know about its origin. Let's start with a simple question: Why China is called China in lots of Western language? And well, the A in the end. This basically means a place in arting, like American, African, etc. So, the question is, what is this guy, Cheng? You may say, well, I know it's Chinese ceramics, right? But actually, this meaning appears long after its origin. It refers to a famous time in Chinese history that is so powerful that gave this land the name, the Qing Dynasty. Let's start our stories in 573 BC, where Qing was just a small country in the west of China. It conquered all six country. In the east, and also the southern China. In 219 BC, the Emperor of Qing sent 500,000 troops in five directions to invade the south. 400,000 of them went directly into the place where Cantonese is spoken now. A series of very cruel war happened with the indigenous people. After nine years of war, the Qing almost lost three hundred thousand people. After victory, the Emperor of Qing ordered the remaining troops to stay in the place in order to develop the region. He set three new provinces, and one of the capital of the province is Panyu, which is more than this canto. After that, the Emperor of Qing ordered thousands of people to migrate to the region. Especially his former nobles, women from the six country he destroyed. Well, the troops and the people who come into the region won't just do nothing. They got to mix culturally and well, biologically with the indigenous people. So, the Cantonese culture was born. After the collapse of the Qing Dynasty, those troops are still there. So they started almost 100 years of autonomy. The region developed very quickly. In 111 BC, the Emperor of the Han Dynasty invaded the country, and autonomy ended. After the Han Dynasty was collapsed, a long event has happened. That is, the people from the north keep come to the south. For convenience, I divided the event into three phases. And the first phase is from the Jin Dynasty to the Tang Dynasty, which is currently shown in the video. This phase almost lasts for 350 years. What you notice that there is always war in the north. The south was relatively peaceful compared to the north, although there are still regime changes. So lots of people migrate from the north to the south. By the Tang Dynasty, Canton has become one of the most important harbors in China. This picture shows the major trading routes of Asia in the 9th century. Here is Canton, and the major trading partner of China at that time included Abbasid Empire in the Arabian Peninsula, Samboja Kingdoms in the modern day Malaysia and Indonesia, and also Japan and. Shaluka Dynasty of India, and also some part of the East African coast also. 
after the Anlushan Rebellion, the Tang Dynasty started to fall, and more and more peoples come to the south also. By the Song Dynasty, the emperor and the people have to come to the south because of the suppress and invasion of northern nomadic nations. Included Mongolian, yeah. So, these three phases of the migration to the south largely changed the Cantonese culture and developed the region. When the time come to the Qing Dynasty, as the global trading increased, in 1685. The Certain Han was born in Kanto. The Han was basically means store, but they are not small store. They are professional organizations that are allowed by the Qing Dynasty government that do foreign trading. In 1757, Kanto became the only port that allowed by the Qing Dynasty that foreign country can do trade with. The merchandise they sell included tea. Porcelain, silk, etc. Before the Qing Dynasty in the 16th century, Portugal was a major trading partner of China. At that time, they ran the land of Macau to do business. From 1550s to 1639, Portugal totally spended around 3 million kilograms of silver in trading with China, because it's very lucrative business to do at that time. And bring the Chinese merchandise back to Europe. Spain has spent its totally about 5.6 million kilogram of silver in trading with China, whereas Britain, from 1637 to 1799, spent 2.1 million kilogram of silvers. Japan's in 1567 to 1644. Spent 7.4 million kilogram of silver. In 1783, the United States sent the first commercial ship called the Empress of China to Canton and started the trade with China as well. There are still other countries who do business with China. If add them all up, from 1567 to 1800. The average annual amount of silver flowed into China is about today's silver price to count is is about 44.8 million dollar. That might not seem a lot compared to today's like trading amount between countries, but it's still enough to make the boss of one of the Hans the richest person in the world. But actually, normal people still don't have access to. Those trading, it's all monopolized by the government, and for foreigners, the government don't allow them to go into China, other than living in Macau or doing business in the Thirteen Han of Canton. The Cantonese culture has always been engaging with the world, and we can see that from the Cantonese language directly. There are mainly four cultures that that consist of the Cantonese language. Which the first two is the indigenous people and the indigenous created culture, which consists of more than 20% of the Cantonese words, like ni, do, ye, etc. And the second one is probably the most important one. That's the Han Chinese culture, which Cantonese use Chinese words, and yeah. And it actually preserved a lot of ancient Chinese words like "za ji," "gei xi," "bei," "zam," etc. And the third one is the cultures around the world. Like there are some words from Indian, like "fa po," "nan mo," and there are also. Lots of words from English also, like "sofa," "chocolate," "size," "zido," etc. And I think this basically explains the Cantonese culture's relationship with the word. Thank you for watching.